A quick thank you to all of my patrons, and a special shout out to Lemu, Firebringer Axel, Enigma Desu, and Ryder Nia for pledging the higher tiers. Your support is heavily appreciated. <sighs> Has it already been another year? Really? Well, business as usual then. Hello once again, fellow Chaldean masters, and welcome to the annual Man Pigs 10 recommendations for servants to save for. No matter what, I'll always do one of these each year, and this one will be no exception. So, I'm sure 2022 has a lot of servants that plenty of people are anticipating, me included. It's a pretty big year for some pretty strong units, so it's best we all prepare in advance right now. But of course, before that, let me remind people about the ground rules of the lists I make so we're all on the same page on what I'm grading, alright? First off, this list is based on gameplay. Of course, people can and should roll for whoever they want, but then this video would be pointless. Instead, I'm trying to give recommendations for those who want strong units for their gameplay, and nothing else. Second, I also factor in their difficulty to obtain. A story-locked or limited servant will take priority over one that isn't, and I also take into account how many times they get a raid up. Third, no welfares. Every player should always aim for welfare, and if you don't, that's on you. And fourth, keyword to this list is recommendations. This list is just my opinion, and won't be fact. This game has so many possible ways to be played, and my way is not necessarily going to be your way. You're free to think whatever servant is better or what you think is the most important in whatever situation. I won't stop you, but please don't be annoying in the comments section. I say this every year because some people seem to never get this memo. And with those rules out of the way, let me give some recommendations for important banners that you should probably think of. Since this year has a few you should note even if they aren't what I'd recommend best gameplay wise. And with those out of the way, let's get to the list. Number 10. Saber, Dios Curry. Now, this might be a huge surprise to a lot of you, especially since I don't usually include permanent servants due to rarity. But the thing is, this year, some permanent servants are quite powerful to the point they genuinely surpass most limiteds. And in my opinion, this 2-in-1 brother-sister duo is absolutely one of those times. Dioscuria has slightly above stats for both HP and attack, which is good stuff. Second are their hit counts. They're really strong. Combined with their NP gain stat, they've got very good spam potential. Always good on an art servant. Helping this is something I rarely mention. The passives. Look at this. I mean, Riding, Madness Enhancement, Avenger Passives, and Twin God Essence that essentially gives a flurry of constant active buffs that make Dioscuri a crit generating, NP regaining crazy with some all around fantastic offensive utility. Their skills might not seem like the most powerful, but they are deceptively effective. First off is a unique on-hit attack skill which will allow Dioscuri to charge NP on quick cards and create stars on arts cards, effectively blurring the lines between both types of card and making both fantastic at each effect. A very, very strong skill. Second is a bit weaker, since it's essentially a weaker Voyager of the Storm with debuff immunity. Not the best skill, but if you're in a DPS party, this will boost damage for one turn easily. Finally, an arts and quick effectiveness up that allows Dioscuri's already effective cards to become even more effective, as well as giving him evasion for one turn. 
The cooldown is a bit higher than I'd like, but otherwise this is a solid skill that gives Dio Scurry survivability, and even further arts and quick consistency. Finally, their NP is a super high 8 hit count single target arts NP that ignores invincibility and defense buffs, before decreasing enemy arts and quick resistance on overcharge to do more damage on consecutive cards. And in fact, with a certain caster, you can essentially refill half of Dio Scurry's NP gauge just by using this NP alone while having all of his skills active. So, basically, Dio Scurry might not do super uber huge amounts of damage immediately, but they are probably one of the most consistent DPS units to ever exist out in the game, with skills that make them able to constantly gen NP and gain stars at the same time to lead into an unavoidable NP that is very easily loopable. Combine all that, and boy, you got yourself a high tier saber. For not a lot of effort, too. They get their first raid up upon the release of Olympus and stay in the gacha permanently. So if you're interested in Dio Scurry, absolutely look out for them. They are worth it. Number 9. Rider, Odysseus. Hey, I don't remember this season of Common Rider. Right after we already got a permanent servant on this recommendation list, we're repeating the trend with Odysseus, who is one of the most ridiculous and one of the most underrated AoE riders out there in my opinion. First of all, he has high attack and solid HP, a very strong start, but what you need to look at are his hit counts. They're pretty high across the board, meaning that he'll be genning tons of stars, and more importantly, NP. I need to bring this up again with his passives, cause he straight up has riding for a 9% quick buff as well as a permanent 10% art buff, which does a surprising amount for his NP gain, which is really fucking good in practice. His skills aren't outstanding, but they're more than good enough. First skill gives him consistent arts and quick damage as well as drawing away damage from one member of the party which is going to be so useful for units without solid defense. Plus, you can combine it with his own 5 turn invincibility plus defense skill, which allows him to more likely receive that NP and tank it. And either way, it still gives him a form of solid defense, which is always good. Finally, he has a 30% NP charge that also increases his own star weight for crits. On a rider, that's definitely gonna make him crit. And with his ridiculously high NP gain, he might as well have already charged his NP gauge. Speaking of NP gauge, Odysseus's NP is him getting into a giant fucking robot horse, launching into the ocean and blasting at any unfortunate enemies with a massive fucking AoE laser. It's impractical, shits all over history, and is freaking awesome! Granted, it can't loop, on its own, but even then, it increases its own NP damage before usage by a considerable amount and removes all defense buffs before usage. For a pre-interluded NP, this is strong. So basically what you're telling me is we have a servant with some of the best NP gain in the game, on an AoE arts rider with high defensive utility, a strong NP that can easily loop with certain supports and can hit through all defense buffs on a permanent unit, and he pilots a giant mecha horse that shoots a massive fuck off laser, while also being a common rider? Boy, I don't care if you're permanent. Get in my Caldea. Now. Odysseus' first raid up happens on White Day, and like I said, he will be permanent. Still, if you want them, be sure to look out for him. He's definitely worth spending a bit for. Number 8. Berserker, Brynhildr. Surprisingly little Summer Servants will be making on this year's list, but one of them is definitely our favorite little Valkyrie supported by her loving boyfriend, Brynhildr. With stats on the board, Bryn has below average stats, which actually doesn't help that much, but in turn, her hit counts are contrarily pretty high, including her buster cards, so she can actually gain pretty decent NP for Berserker. Skill-wise, her first skill is simultaneously a 2-hit evade and 3-hit damage cut, both for 3 turns, which is an absolutely fantastic form of survivability for a Berserker as far as I'm concerned. Never underestimate a good damage cut, 
especially one tied with an evade. Second skill allows her to regenerate NP and stars per turn, which is a great way of ensuring consistency in both NP gain and star gen. And finally, she has a 30% arts and buster buff for 3 turns, which not only increases her own buster damage, but arts gain as well. Plus, it gives this same effect to other Brynhildr's beloved allies on the field, which is literally just a free bonus that I don't think anyone's going to be complaining about. Seriously, free color buffs? Hell yeah. Finally, her NP is an AoE buster NP that ignores invincibility and also increases self buster damage before usage. It's a simple NP, but it hits pretty hard. And combined with her third skill, the buster buff might as well be a mana burst too, which is pretty neat. Brynhildr isn't the most unique berserker out there, but that doesn't change the fact that she's good. She's very consistent and definitely worth using if you like her or need more options for AoE units. Plus, her and Sigurd are always going to be a sight for sore eyes. If you want her, she is going to be available during Summer 5 Banner 1, which will also get a rerun in a year, so watch out for that. Number 7. Archer, Seishonagon. <sighs> well, this is a unit that I've definitely been kind of dreading, but putting my personal beef aside, it'd be a disservice to her if I didn't recognize how powerful she actually is. This tryhard meme lord is easily one of the best quick archers in the game. With a high attack stat that helps her damaging nature, solid quick hit counts, and more notably, extra star weight and crit damage for her quick cards through her passives, which makes her an obvious quick servant with some pretty abnormally good base quick cards. Skill-wise, her first skill is a powerful charisma variant that increases attack, regens HP, and regens NP charge as well for 3 out of 6 turns. It's a very nice charisma. Although, the higher cooldown does hurt it a tiny bit. Second skill is an evade and crit damage up combination that are each 3 hit out of 3 turn effects. The evade is the real wonder here. It's essentially a marginally weaker protection from arrows. Excellent skill. Final skill is a 3 turn 30% quick buff that also charges NP gauge and gens a bit of stars. This combo works well with her charisma for more damage and also charging NP purposes, as well as further making her quick cards even better. Finally, her NP is a cause of constant discomfort for me since I'm a 5 centimeters per second fan, and the scenery shown in her NP is uncomfortably similar to the sights seen in that film. And if you know how that film is, you know it fucks me up. So to be frank, I hate seeing this NP because it just makes me sad. Ignoring all of that though, it's an AoE quick NP which increases her damage for both neutral and shadow servants, as well as man attributes for overcharge all before the NP itself hits. This covers a lot of servants, so while it's not super useful for mob farming setups, this NP might be useful in some niche situations against those enemies. Unfortunately, this NP isn't good enough to Scotty 3 turn farm, but I'd still say it's good enough. I have my issues with Say herself, but it's undeniable that she's a great unit. So for those who don't get worryingly high levels of heartache looking at her NP like I do, she goes up on Raid Up during the Valentine's event and its rerun. So look out for her. Number 6. Lancer. Romulus Quirinus. Everything. Everything. Everything in this world leads to Ro- Wait, Ro- <laughs> That's actually a pretty funny typo. Okay, I'm leaving that in. Coming next on the list is our Grand Lancer, Romulus Quirinus. Considering how powerful the other Grand Candidates are, you'd think him being in 6th place means that he's a step down. And while Roma isn't as broken as Merlin or Chungus Orion, he damn well holds his place. Roma has the highest attack stat of any Lancer, meaning this living god dishes insane amounts of damage, whilst having good hit counts on all cards, with a rare double arts and buster deck for a Lancer. Furthermore, he has passives that also increase his own crit damage and buster damage. These pair well with the skills that this nation founder will have. First of his skill is basically a charisma variant that increases attack as well as crit damage similar to Ishtar's first skill. However, it also increases crit damage further for Roman enemies, 
which means that in a party of Romans, this is essentially a party 50% crit buff for 3 turns. And even without them, Romulus himself will always have that 50% crit buff. On top of that, it also turns the party into Roman allies. However, this is an effect that applies after the Roman crit buff. So you can't just use this skill to give everyone an automatic 50% crit buff, unless you're running two Romuluses, or having allies that become Romans through another method. His second skill is a two-hit invincibility for three turns, which alone is pretty fantastic. But it also acts as a 30% charge and a 10 star bomb. The stars are kind of useful in context of Roma since he is a buster crit unit, but the charge is what I love here. It allows him to farm so much better, and this isn't even to mention the fact that this gives him his own survivability. Finally, he has a 3 turn 30% buster buff that also increases his own buster card star weight for 1 turn. This is fantastic for buster crit teams with stars, and pairs great with his own charisma which already has the attack and powerful crit buff. This skill also applies the Roman traits to any enemy that Romulus is able to crit on which is useful because of his NP. This one is pretty loaded. At base, it's an AoE buster NP that first deals extra damage to Roman enemies, so if you use his third skill to crit any enemies, they get hit. Hard. Secondly, it then turns all enemies into Roman enemies, so if they weren't Roman before, they are now. Finally, it also turns allies into Roman allies, which means, remember that charisma, yeah, now all allies can get that 50% crit buff. Finally, it also further increases the attack for the party after the NP is used, just for good measure. This turns Roba into an absolute beast of a Lancer that dishes out high buster crit damage with Roman power. Obviously, you might want to consider timing when you want to use certain skills or its NP when you're thinking about allies or enemies with Roman buffs, but even if you don't consider all that complex stuff, you still get a high DPS crit lancer that can also easily farm and survive on his own in a difficult fight. He's a fantastic option to anyone that's interested in him, and dare I say is a must roll for those who want a strong lancer. Not to mention, his animations are god tier. So, if you want him, Roma comes in at Olympus Banner 2, as well as the Holy Grail front event so you get good chances to get him if you're interested. Don't waste them. Number 5. Foreigner, Yang Guihui. If you know me, I like to poke fun at Chinese culture a lot, but sometimes I actually show pride in Chinese culture, and this is one of those moments. <sighs> God fucking bless China. Never mind. Jokes aside, Yu Huan is a servant that has seen a lot of improvement after her recent buff to the point that it pushed her from not making this list at all into becoming the fifth servant on the list. First of all, Yu Huan has the highest attack of every foreigner with a surprisingly decent HP stat to pair. Not bad at all. She has solid NP gain and very good hits across the board. This seems to be a running trend this year, huh? Her passes aren't remarkable, but like any foreigner, she passively generates stars per turn, which pairs well with her two 4-hit quick cards. Skill-wise, her first skill is a bit interesting. It's a 6-turn invincibility that's also tied to a taunt, similar to Shi Huang's NP, but on a skill. The catch is that it only works for males, which does limit viability for her a lot. It does have an NP regen and star bomb attached to it, so it's not a bad skill by any means, just one with some limitations that really affects her. That is, until we got her buff. Now the taunt applies to every enemy, regardless of gender, and also increases her star bomb. This buff seems tiny, but trust me when I say, in the context to her kit, it makes her viability absolutely skyrocket. Second skill is an NP gain absorb similar to Lancer Melt's Melt Envy. However, instead of absorbing allies, it instead absorbs enemies, as well as reduces their defense for 3 turns. This is a pretty great skill, in theory. The issue with it is that it's on a 7 turn cooldown. What the fuck? For a skill that you're going to use later into the battle, this is way too much. Not to mention, Yu Huan is a single target unit. So unless you're fighting a boss with 2 enemies, this skill is never going to show its true potential. 
Her final skill is a skill that when enemies attack her, reduces their enemy defense and burns them for 3 attacks in 3 turns while increasing Yu Huan's own defense for 3 turns. This is a great skill specifically when combined with her taunt, as it allows her to not only draw attention, but also debuff the enemies. This works well against bosses if they attack her 3 times in a row, as they get 3 burns and 3 death downs. Why you would want this is essentially because of her NP, which deals extra damage to enemies that are burnt. If you use this skill, it essentially combos in a way that lets Yu Huan burn her enemies, reducing their defense before roasting them alive with this NP. It also further inflicts burn on them for 3 turns for a significant 3k HP per turn, which is a pretty neat bonus. Yu Huan can thus dish out pretty strong damage to any enemy and shoot off her NP again pretty consistently due to her arts card typing. Compared to her peers, I'd definitely say that she's an upgrade to Abigail both due to her solid defense and League's better NP gain. Although, whether she's better than Double X will depend a lot on your preference since Double X has an NP interlude that boosts her damage a lot. Either way, if you do want this cute China girl, she'll be available during the New Year's banner, as well as the Imaginary Scramble pre-release campaign. So for those interested, please, by all means, look out for her. Number 4. Foreigner. Voyager. Messenger for the stars. Representative of humanity. Our Voyager. Carry our voices into the end of space for the dreams of the perfect human. Ah, Voyager. One of my favorite servants of all time. It might just be the planetarian bias. In fact, it definitely is. But the space probe being a symbol for humanity really is a beautiful thing. Anyway, we're not here to talk about how Voyager is a beautiful servant as a concept, but more of his extraordinary gameplay. Stat-wise, it doesn't look great though, as Voyager's attack stat is comparatively low. His hit counts though are solid, and his NP and star gen stats are both above the average range, especially his star gen. Which is important, since he is a quick unit. He, as a result, benefits from his foreigner passive of generating stars, and also has a crit strength as well as internal arts buff as a bonus. Skill-wise, first skill is a 50% battery. Need I say more? That alone is powerful as shit, but apparently Delightworks didn't think so, so they also slapped a 3 turn debuff immunity and a small star bomb just for the sake of it. Is it important for his gameplay? No, you're gonna be using this for the charge and nothing else. Is it still cool? Absolutely. Second skill is his evade, although it's also tied to a strong damage steroid skill that increases Voyager's quick damage for 3 turns and decreases one enemy's quick resist for 3 turns as well. This is a pretty good skill in context of one target, although some will find that the fact that it's paired with the evade annoying and I do personally wish that the quick resist down was AoE. Finally, he has a skill which increases an ally's star weight for one turn while increasing party crit damage as well as a unique effect, crit attack resistance for three turns. It's a simple crit skill, but it works for what it needs to do. Although, only one turn of crit weight does hurt a bit. Finally, his NP is an AoE quick NP that first increases Voyager's NP damage based on overcharge and also deals extra damage to sky attribute enemies. Plus. Charging the party NP gauge after usage, and not only that, but for living human allies, so basically most pseudo servants and some crossover characters since they're alive, they get an extra 10%. This is an excellent NP that is very easily looped with double Scotty, and with living human allies is even more powerful. I mean, we've all seen that perpetual Mew video, I'm sure, and ever since Mew's buff, the two are going to pair all the more excellently. Voyager is a simple but effective quick servant that makes up for his lacking attack with a shit ton of multiplier buffs and a powerful NP gen. In terms of foreigners, he's still a step down compared to Hokusai, but definitely still one of the best in the class. If you need him, he goes on raid up during the Fate Requiem collab event, as well as the Caldea Boys 2021 banner, so definitely look out for those. Number 3. Alter Ego Ashia Doman. Ah, Doman, Doman, Doman. Along with Muramasa, Doman was one of the most hyped parts of Lost Belt and a servant we've been long waiting for since his initial appearance as Castor Limbo. But, oh man, was that wait worth it. Because Doman comes in as one of the best alter egos we could possibly ask for. First of all, 
He has a strong stat spread with high attack and solid HP to accompany it. Strong hit counts on all cards for great star gen with an above average NP gen for that extra consistency. Passive wise, he's essentially got a caster passive spread with an insta kill modifier, solid damage, and he also gains more NP when he's getting attacked. Skill wise, let's break these monsters one by one. First skill is a stacked ass powerful reverse charisma that decreases enemy death by 30%, attack by 20%, along with inflicting terror and confusion on them for RNG debuffs, as well as finally a 500% damage curse just for a cherry on top. It's a pretty loaded skill to be sure, but the first two effects are the real draw here. Basically, just see this as a more powerful reverse charisma that works really well. Second skill is a Guts that lasts for surprising two times for three turns. This alone is a pretty strong ass Guts in my opinion, just based on the fact it doesn't proc once, while still having a 7 turn cooldown. Not only that, but it also increases party crit damage for chaotic and evil allies respectively for three turns, each by a whole ass 50%. Yes, it's tied to a Guts, but that's a powerful ass mod to have for three turns. And since the guts is two times, it's not that bad of a loss. Domon himself is chaotic evil, so the boss spread to himself 100% each time, and I'd argue that is good enough. But the fact he spreads those effects to his allies as well is just icing on the cake. That pushes this skill into pointlessly ridiculous, especially considering the fact Domon is a quick servant, so you're gonna have stars anyways. Finally, his third skill is, uh, oh boy. An 80% NP battery, yes, 80%, Xuanzang style, as well as a true charisma that buffs, once again, chaotic and evil allies, each. Meaning, Dolmon himself of course gets a 40% attack buff, and any other party members that are either chaotic or evil get 20% each. Paired with his first and second skills, you're looking at a shit ton of damage for any chaotic servant on the field, let alone just Dolmon himself. Oh right, it also curses them too again in case you needed that. Sure, this one is weaker because it's on a high ass cooldown, but honestly, I think it's worth it. Domon's weakness being that he has this long downtime is a fair one considering how strong these skills are. Also, notice how his buffs aren't quick buffs, meaning they would multiply with an outside quick buff. So if you have Scotty... Yeah, <laughs> boy. And finally, we get to his AoE Quick NP, which does what any AoE Quick NP does. While it does have insta kill, this one is pretty forgettable and useless. It does have an evil curse as well as its own curse, so it stacks with Domon's first and third skills if you happen to use them together. With double Scotty, he's barely able to loop even without overkill, so he's definitely worth using to farm if you need it. Being an alter ego, Domon becomes a very versatile servant able to take many fights and deal a shit ton of damage. He's not as broken as some of the best DPS servants out there, but that's only because of the high cooldowns created by his incredible skills. If he gets an NP interlude, I'd say he'd make an argument for the best alter ego in the game, but even as is, he's definitely a unit that's worth the wait, and is very much worth using. He'll be going up on raid up during the Heian Kyo release, as well as the Summer 6 banner. So, if you want him, look at him during those times. Number 2. Moon Cancer, Kiara Sessioin. Kiara deadass went to BB and was like, fuck you bitch, mine now. Not gonna lie, I've been low-key dreading talking about Kiara because she's a very loaded unit. So this is gonna take a good while. Stat-wise, she has subpar damage but high HP, typical of a Kiara unit. Although, she does have good hit counts yet again, and some very powerful passive that boosts her arts card NP damage, slight crit strength, as well as defense up against humanoid enemies such as servants. Skill wise, this is where she gets fun. Specifically, the first skill, Mermaid's Flesh is, oh boy. First off, a guts for 5 turns on a 6 turn cooldown. This is a very solid guts that alone is better than most. Second. She removes all debuffs on self, always good on a unit in case there's something like an NP seal or something annoying. Then, it also regens HP for 3 turns, 
So at max level, it's essentially becoming a 6k heal, as well as increasing her own NP damage by 20% for 3 turns. The reason the NP damage is up for 3 turns is due to the following effect, which is the real star of the skill if the 4 effects weren't powerful enough. Kiara gives herself a unique buff called Mermaid's Nourishment, which essentially allows Kiara to boost the power of her own other skills by 2 times. She gets one layer of Mermaid's Nourishment every turn for 4 turns, so every time the skill is used, she can use all stacks on a single skill if timed right, but it's not a necessity. This is a pretty loaded skill, that would already be super powerful as shit even without the gimmick. But with the gimmick in mind, her second skill is her charge. At base, it's a 30% NP charge that generates stars on a 5 turn cooldown. Think of it similar to Artoria's charge, but with one stack of nourishment, this becomes a 40% charge that adds another 5 stars, and with two stacks of nourishment, it becomes a full 50% charge with 30 total stars. This is already a strong skill on its own, and with nourishment, it only gets better. Her final skill grants party evasion for one time lasting 3 turns, similar to Harp of Healing, while also removing sure hit buffs from all enemies, but more importantly, gives a unique debuff for the enemy that is called Bewitchment, which is both a crit chance down, death down, and arch resist down for the party. Bewitchment is essentially a stronger reverse charisma since it debuffs both defense and arch resist by 20%, which does multiply. Then when you factor in nourishment, one stack increases both numbers to 25%, and two stacks pushes them even further to 30%. Don't underestimate a stacked 30% death down and 30% arts down multiplier. Combined with her passives, this is very strong. They allow her to do pretty good NP damage despite her neutral class. Now we get to Kiara's NP, which is an AoE arts NP. The overcharge effect being insta-kill isn't worth bringing up, but it also does do 100% special damage to enemies that increases mental debuffs. And not just once, depending on how many mental debuffs they have, it does increase by a further 20%. Bewitchment does count as a debuff, so her third skill is definitely meant to be used in tandem with her NP. However, further charms or sleep can increase her damage further. Kiara is a very complicated unit with a lot of potential methods to use her myriad of buffs. I don't want to overcomplicate this video, so I'll just say this. She's absolutely one of the strongest extra classes in the game, and gives every Moon Cancer in existence a very good run for their money. Combined with art supports, there's just no competition. She's one of the strongest farmers you could ask for. She's not quite as simple to use as Astarte or the upcoming Muramasa, but she's definitely worth rolling. In terms of DPS units, she's easily the star of the year. If you do desire her, she is on raid up for Summer 5 Banner 1, as well as its rerun along with Brynhildr. So if you're interested in both units, definitely roll her then. That being said, as stacked as Kiara is, both figuratively and literally, she's still somehow not the best unit of the year and I'm sure we all know why. So what unit must be so powerful that dethrones even Moon Cancer Kiara? It must be a pretty broken unit, right? Number 1 Cast- Actually no, fuck it, it's Castor Artorio, okay? I don't even know why I tried building this up. Everyone who plays this game to some extent knew that this was coming, and I refuse to believe that there isn't a player that didn't. I think the best way to describe Castor Artoria is this. Remember Merlin? That unit that was so powerful that he utterly broke the game and affected the balance for the rest of the game's lifespan permanently. Okay, so imagine 90% of that unit, but instead of Buster, it's Arts, and they essentially made him two times better by replacing the healing and stars by making it so every Arts servant will be able to loop constantly, insanely well, with no effort. That's Castor Artoria. I might as well end the review here, honestly, but let's do her some justice and see exactly why she completely breaks the game. First off, stats. Slightly above average HP and below average attack. For support, this is good. 
She has high hit counts and solid NP gen similar to Voyager, but Territory Creation EX pushes her NP gen into above average. With another passive that also increases her own crit damage for Arts card, as well as crit chance resistance after you beat Lost Belt 6. Overall, pretty solid passive set for a support caster. The real ridiculousness though begins with her skills. First off, remember our dream like Charisma? That 20% charge and Charisma hybrid that we all thought was one of the best Charisma in the game? Yeah, Artorias straight up has a superior version of it that charges 30% instead. Well, off to a great start! <laughs> Second skill is a targetable 20% charge, which means that she can charge the party by 30% and one ally with a total of 50% with this skill. Not only that, but it also increases the NP gain of the entire party by 30%. Now this doesn't seem amazing, but trust me when I say, this skill changes everything. The third skill is her targeted support buff. This gives a 50% arts buff for 3 turns, increases their damage against threat against humanity enemies for 3 turns, cause you know, why not, and an invincibility for 3 turns. This is a very strong skill that gives both offensive and support aspects, but I don't know if you notice. All of their skills work with NP gain. Skill 1 is a party NP charge. Skill 2 is a targeted charge with NP gain. And skill 3 increases art's effectiveness. That means one ally can be charged to 50% and generate NP like absolute insanity. Especially if that unit has an AoE art's NP. And this isn't even to account a second Castoria. Have you guys seen a double Castoria comp? They're, they're, they're insane. You're basically able to make almost any arts unit loop, and even single target units regen a pretty good amount. And this isn't even including her own NP, which is even more ridiculous. Her NP further increases party attack by 30%, which, combined with her charisma, effectively gives the party 50% attack for 3 turns, which will indeed multiply with her 50% arts buff. More so, it removes debuff, in case you know, anything was holding you back, not anymore. And finally, true defense for 3 turns, with hits based on overcharge. True defense is essentially an invincibility, but Pierce Invin does not work on it. So if you want to get it out of the way, it must be removed either the classic way of attacking it, or with buff removal. This is not even combined with the normal invincibility that she has on skill 3. If you overcharge this, you can make the true invincibility take even more hits. And as someone who's used Castoria, two hits is already plenty enough in my book. Basically, fucking rip John. So, what does this mean? Well, first of all, one Castoria alone is able to charge NP gauges more than even Waver, while also uber charging NP gen for one arts unit so they can loop with basically no problem. This alone is broken, but moreover she also increases party attack, and a unit's arts effectiveness by a huge amount, meaning DPS will basically skyrocket for any arts unit. And finally, if the invincibility wasn't enough, her NP has party debuff clear and party true defense, which even if it's one hit is absurdly powerful against hard bosses, especially if they have a passive pierce infin active. This skill set is simple, but ripe with options. First, you can use this with Merlin for more one turn survivability, star gen, and healing, or you can do Tamamo, as Tamamo's main weakness is no debuff clear, while Tamamo fixes Castoria's weakness of no healing, while Tamamo can increase NP damage, which is a buff Castoria can't actually offer, as well as give a further arts buff and reduce party cooldown, meaning these two units pair indescribably well for a stall fight. But, more importantly, these are effects that you can effectively double with a support Castoria. Meaning, yeah, two Castorias are pretty insane. In a hard fight, sure you have no healing, but the DPS and NP spam will be so insane that you might as well not even worry about it unless you're fighting something absolutely ridiculous. Cough cough, Lost Belt 6. They're able to supercharge any arts unit into an NP spamming, damage dealing god. And as long as you have one Castoria with NP gauge, survivability isn't too much of a worry either since you got debuff clears and true defense. 
it's just a broken combination. Castoria is so strong that she's relevant in every situation. She's not like Scotty where one is kinda strong and two is broken. No, Castoria is broken on her own and defeats even Merlin with how powerful she makes arts unit spam. Like literally, the one weakness she has is no healing which can be easily remedied with another support like Tamamo. Either way, the story is you want Castoria. You must not miss Castoria. If you want to farm, double Castoria makes it way too easy. If you want to win a hard fight, her and Tomo trivialize most content. And if you want a good servant, this is the best servant in the game. Straight up. So, watch out for that 5th anniversary raid up and the Lost Belt 6 pre-campaign together. You will be rolling these. Unless you for some strange ass reason dislike Castoria. In which case, fair enough. Your pain is valid, but you're wrong, I'm sorry. Anyway, with that final option out of the way, that's going to be it for this year of 10 recommendations for servants to save for. It's a pretty wild year, and Castoria alone pretty much shakes the game to the point everyone should just get her. Either way, this year is definitely another year of quartz killing, and judging from the last year in JP, that's not going to stop anytime soon. With that being said, thanks for watching this video, and feel free to share what servants you're looking forward to in the future as well. If you're a JP player, share your experiences and what units you enjoy using. But for me, that's all for now. So, until next time, I bid all of you fellow Chaldean Masters a grand farewell. And hopefully I'll see you all somewhere else on the internet. Until then, have a wonderful year.